back in 2004, it seemed the RPGs would rule the world for a thousand years. In 2007, RPGs were dead. Rock Paper Shotgun, 2008. Kieron Gillen, a co-founder of the website, interviews the pseudonymous Vince D. Weller of the Iron Tower Studios, a small indie developer in process of making their first game. The Age of Decadence, a post-apocalyptic adventure with a Roman aesthetic, palace intrigue, flying ships, ancient Egyptian power armor, there was something for everyone. The game was an ambassador of the philosophy of RPG design that proliferated on old message boards. Rule number one of the forum's theory is that an RPG should be systems heavy, with a lot of numbers, formulas and abbreviations. Rule number two of the forum's theory is don't treat your audience like they're morons. Yes, it is a thinly veiled anti-Bethesda statement, but what confused Kiron and the audience of Rock Paper Shotgun was the decision to make the Age of Decadence turn-based. They took their combat model from Bookworm Adventure, Snore. Isn't it weird? Turn-based was fine in 1998, the year of Fallout 2. Turn-based is fine in 2023, the year of Baldur's Gate. Turn-based was embarrassing in 2008 makes you think about society. Anyways, The Age of Decadence was eventually released in 2015, and it was a weapon, a weapon to stab the chief of demons in his black heart. The Great War was hundreds of years ago. The knowledge of the old days is forgotten. The story begins in Tehran, a small crumbling town on the edge of the world. The noble house controlling Tehran has seen better days. The ancient house Daratan used to be one of the most powerful entities in the old empire, commanding 20 legions. Daratan soldiers stood their ground no matter the odds, until they were destroyed in the war where gods fought alongside men against the cowardly foreigners, the Kantari. The first thing the game asks us to do is to pick our character's professional background. The choice of the faction is effectively the choice of the main quest. Thieves won't get to see Praetor content. Assassins won't get to explore the thief story. You'll have to replay the game as different characters to get a complete picture of what's going on. My name is Gaius. I'm a scholar, or a lore master as the nomenclature goes, an investigator, a student of history, ancient mantras and artifacts. I am somewhat multidisciplinary. A great philosopher once told me that you can get ideas from anywhere. Kill 27 men, says Agatai of the Boatmen of Styx, the Assassin's Guild. Then you'll know what I know. Each man you kill teaches you something. This is a basic combat character template. We are quick, perceptive, smart, and kind of ugly. This arrangement of stats makes the character good at both combat and exploration, but not at conversation. Gaius is not a dialoguer. Once you picked a combat skill, you'll be putting points in that and in nothing else, like in most games. The non-combat skills, or liberal arts and crafts, follow the opposite logic. It pays off to dabble in a bunch of stuff without over committing to anything until mid or even late game. So these are the basics. Let's experience the adventure like no other. Gaius is an apprentice of one of the few learned individuals residing in Tehran, the old lore master Fang. Remember what I taught you. Take a good look, show some excitement, tell them it's a valuable artifact that's worth a lot to the right collector. Wait for the words to sink in, and then ask for a hundred Imperials to research it further. What if it actually is a valuable artifact? Oh, this town doesn't have anything of value, which is probably the reason Antidas is still in charge. Master Feng certainly knows much about ancient artifacts, and by the looks of it, he even has some in production. We go to the inn and meet the client. The merchant hands us an old map. The seal reads, Thor, a goth, one of the gods of the empire, the maker of machines. There are decades where nothing happens, and there are weeks where decades happen. It's a treasure map. The treasure could be an ancient weapon of mass destruction, or an imperial wireless charger or anything in between. The protagonists of all backgrounds will eventually be getting the MacGuffin. The assassin does it by looting the corpse of the merchant they killed. The praetor does it by investigating the murder. The lore master does it via their grift. 
You see, Gaius, being a lore master isn't about dealing with rarities. Knowing how to deal with people is equally important. Lord Antidas invited another scholar to Tehran, but Feng doesn't share his opinion that two heads are better than one. Are you asking me to kill him? When you have a thorn in your side, do you not remove it? Ah, perhaps you think that a man isn't a thorn, that a man's life, unlike that of an insect, has some value. It doesn't. Truly, I should be charging you for these lessons. Critical Strike is a combat skill that governs critical hit chance. It can also be used in dialogue if your character has a dagger in their inventory. The rival lore master becomes Gaius first kill, but not the last, no. Now that we are finally done with the opening, we are free to explore Tehran. When I recommend the Age of Decadence to other people, they complete the intro quest, then they express their appreciation for how complex and boomer-coded the game is, and then they quit playing for Forever. Understandable, it's hard to get past the near impenetrable layer of Torque 3D jank. The environment is hard to read, even with the object highlight enabled, the free camera is annoying to control, sometimes the screen will start blinking rapidly, the game is trying to kill you via epilepsy. Are you a bad enough individual to survive the age of decadence? Another problem is the structure of the Tehran chapter. The game is famous for its difficulty, the quests have high skill requirements. Requirements. There is no grinding. In order to do sophisticated quests, you need to first gain experience by doing lesser quests. Tehran might seem like a big city type of a location, but there is actually a fairly strict linear way of doing content. 1. Put a few points in sneak and lockpick, rob the blacksmith's house, and then the inn. 2. Go to the graveyard, pick a rope and a grappling hook from a dead body that's hard to see. 3. Use it to rob one of the rich houses houses next to the palace. 4. Sell everything, buy or craft a passable beginner armor. 5. Practice on the bombs at the ruined guard tower. 6. Kill the gang behind the thieves guild building. This design is a product of the old forums culture. Whatever you need. Every grand theory of RPGs has some sort of an ironic flaw, and the flaw of the forums theory was excessive reductionism. Individuals would identify a quality their favorite games possess, and then they would obsess over it for years at the expense of everything else. If we get the CRPG systems right, and maybe add some choices and consequences, then the rest of the game will just sort itself out. Well, it didn't. Now that we got some experience, it's time to join a faction. This is not actually a bad idea. I can only teach you so much, and you need all the help you can get. He says we should join the merchants and stay away from the military. With Karinas, you might get more than you bargained for. The army of the Empire still exists, even though the state does not. Legate Karinas was sent to Tehran by Kair Tor to, quote, prevent Antidas from doing anything stupid. So the first Imperial Guards quest is insane. We are the backbone of the Empire, says the Centurion to the recruits. We've been making fighters out of local scum for more than a thousand years. Of course, you boys set a new standard for local scum. <laughs> Our job is to dress up as wasteland raiders and attack a trading caravan. A common advice you find in various AOD guides is to prioritize defense over offense. This is a good idea for most builds. We occupy the attention of two of the guards, as well as the crossbow armed merchant, while our boys dish out the damage. Good job. The merchants just left. They begged us to do anything in our power to protect Tehran. Helping citizens in need is what the Imperial Guard is all about. There is one problem, though. The merchants said that two raiders got away, so we need to produce two bodies they recognize. So we can only take one of you. Whoever kills the other two first gets the job. <laughs> This is a very Vince kind of quest, an overcomplicated multi-stage plan that goes wrong in a very specific way that ensures that most participants die. <laughs> well, well, well. To be honest, I thought it was going to be the other guy, but I like surprises. Welcome to the Imperial Guards, the only home you'll ever need. An important AOD pro tip is to delay the second quest in a faction storyline for as long as possible, because it's a point of no return. We'll be doing everything else in Tehran before returning to the Guards content. So Jan Cassius is no more. Good riddance, I say. Such a pompous ass that boy was. I owe you a lot more than I paid you. 
He gives us a ring. It's the famous magical ring of General Galbo. The ring was crafted by the Council of Magi to grant the general special powers which made him unstoppable in battle. The ring was lost for centuries. Its reappearance is a great omen. What did you use? Zinc sulfide? Phosphorus? So as I was saying, the ring changed many hands until it was acquired by your great-grandfather. Since you are quite obviously unworthy of possessing such an artifact, you decided to offer it to Lord Antidas as tribute. Fang wants us to present the ring, as well as the map we got from the merchant, to the Master of Tehran. The problem is, we are a nobody. We can't just go and see him. We don't have the privileges. So what follows next is the Tehran Palace infiltration sequence, which is the most Vince quest of all time. Since the game doesn't have proper stealth mechanics, the infiltration is done via dialogue. Basically, it's a choose-your-own-adventure kind of segment, but with skill checks. We sneak into various buildings in the compound, steal treasure, kill guards via dialogue-based critical strike, and even increase our social skills by examining artifacts in Antida's private chambers. This stuff is elaborate. Here is me hiding underneath a table while the servants are clearing up a recent meal. After we're done killing the guards and stealing valuables, we go to the throne room, face Antidas, and show him the map we got from the merchant. The Lord of Tehran is confused. A murder hobo sneaks into his home with pockets full of stolen valuables and a trail of bodies behind them. Why would I spare his worthless life? Antidas is asking himself. But then he looks at our character sheet and sees that murdering the palace guards put us above the threshold where Gaius murder skills are considered to be impressive. Welcome aboard! We need people like you in our organization. Antidas gives us a bunch of side quests and he doesn't even bother bother examining the map we brought, or confiscating our murder loot. The palace infiltration scene feels like a dream sequence. We stole enough material to craft a reasonable suit of armor and a weapon. I think it's time for us to meet the true main character of the Age of Decadence. A moment of your time, kind master. I am Miltiades, a merchant by trade. Miltiades is a scam artist. He's an operator. He shapes the narrative, tips his landlord, collects rare fish, sells things he doesn't own. He says there is free stuff in the house behind him, but actually, it's just two hired killers. I guess the free stuff was us. Gaius, I was looking everywhere for you. They could have killed me. Could have, but didn't. Let's not get sidetracked by hypotheticals. Let's focus on what's important. You made a ton of money in, what, 10 minutes? Listen, let bygones be bygones. Look me up in my door and partner. Trust me, it's gonna be big. You'll thank me for looking after you one day. Time for us to do Antida's side quests. The captain of the guard marked two locations on our world map. The game doesn't have travel mechanics per se. What you see is a visualization I made in Premiere Pro. Moving between locations takes days or weeks, but from the player's point of view it's instantaneous. And more importantly, it feels instantaneous. It doesn't feel like a journey. That's the camp where a bunch of raiders are keeping Tiberius, a relative of Antidas, in a cage. For ransom. Yes, the situation can be resolved in all sorts of clever Vincian ways. Negotiate, 4D chess the various groups of bandits against each other. But remember what a wise man said, every kill teaches you something. We can learn a lot from these people. Uh, I won't forget it, Tiberius whispers from his cage. The second quest is about dealing with the Aurelian legionnaires who constructed an outpost around an old mine uncomfortably close to Tehran. House Aurelian controls the city of Mardoran. It's the most powerful of the great houses and a rival of House Daratan. After the guards are dealt with, we have to pacify the mining personnel. It's a swarm type of encounter. The workers' attacks are weak and inaccurate, but there are a lot of them and they do occasionally crit. <laughs> Kill count, 41. With effort, the ancient machines can be reactivated to make advanced weapons and armors for House Daratan. But is it really in our best interest to do that? I feel Master Fang would advise against attaching ourselves to an idiot like Antidas. Do you believe in destiny, Gaius? I have wasted a fortune and lost more men than I dare to admit. And just when I've decided to give up, you show up with a map. 
The treasure map from the prologue. The Empire conquered the known world. The era of peace and prosperity was about to begin when the accursed Kantari came. We fought the devils tooth and nail, but when the victory was at hand, they called forth their gods. The Empire had to summon divine allies to even the odds, but in the end, Everyone lost. Antidas lectures us on ancient history. I thought it was my job. He believes that somewhere in the wasteland is the lost temple of Thoragoth, full of ancient weapons of war. The Lord of Tehran sends us on an expedition, promising status and riches should we find it. Sure thing, Ant-Man. I'll get right on that. We have received a formal complaint from the Merchants Guild. It appears the local militia is no longer able to protect the town. The recent events have practically forced Karina's hand. While Antidas is daydreaming, the Imperial Guards are taking over Tehran. Here is the situation. House Daratan is a dying house. The Charter allows us to step in temporarily and defend Imperial property. <laughs> And so commences the bloodiest battle of the chapter. Antidas is the weakest link. The toughest opponent in this fight, and possibly the toughest bastard in Tehran, is Dalar, the captain of the guard. We soften him up with explosives and then kite Dalar around the arena by throwing nets. With him out of the way, our boys soon get the upper hand. House Daratan is no more. You're good in a fight, Gaius, but where we are going, you'd have to be better than most. For the next several days, while Karina sorts out the governance-related issues, we train with the best instructors of the guard for major bonuses to every combat skill. Destroying a thousand-year-old house is an extraordinary event. Lord Galius of House Aurelian demands we are brought to him in chains. This is the end of Chapter 1. Tehran is under martial law. The undesirable elements are crucified as a warning to others. A week ago, House Aurelian was the greatest power in the Empire. Now, it's not that clear. Concerned with the state of affairs, Lord Galius sends secret messengers to the Ordu, the powerful army of steppe warriors. He intends to invite them to Madoran and use the Horde as his private fighting force, hoping they'll keep the Imperial Guards at bay. Once the jewel of the Empire, Madoran is now a city of crumbling ruins and forgotten glory. The rivers that fed it dry, the fertile fields are now barren rock and drifting sand. A very poetic description of the biggest city in the game. We are brought before Galius. Lord Antidas has been slain in his own palace. Slain not by the outside forces, but by the enemies within. The Imperial Guards. He is speaking like a politician, an orator working his audience. One of the murderers is here today to plead his innocence and try to convince us that the attack was somehow justified. Speak, villain. We can argue our case, but that requires social skills Gaius does not possess. We are about to get executed. I demand trial by combat, and they do accommodate us. Yeah, malnourished bums on death row, my only weakness. Well, what do you know? Looks like you are innocent of all charges. Madoran, City of Light, City of Magic. The Imperial Guards occupy a fort not far from the big gate. Legatus Pavala should have our things. Karinas! That son of a bitch could never get along with anyone. They thought they got rid of him when they sent him to Tehran. He sure showed them. Here is our character page at the start of Chapter 2. Infiltrator, Terminator, Kingslayer, Centurion. Gaius is an 80s metal band in a trench coat. Look what crawled out of some shithole and made it way to our glorious city. How about a job in the entertainment industry? The master of the arena gives us the most convincing fake smile you've ever seen. Your first opponent is a newcomer like you. Fancies himself a thief. Poor bastard thinks we live like animals without rules and laws. He doesn't look like a fighting sword, but claims he killed a man or two. I know, I know. Just enter the arena, got him like a fish, and we'll continue this conversation. Your next victim is a zealot. An old man, but there is plenty of fire in him. Claimed that voices told him to spread the divine word and bring salvation. People laughed at him, told him to fuck off. He snapped and... 
Isate is the crossbow kid. There's not much of a challenge either. Fighting the Kingslayer Centurion isn't quite the same as shooting drunk merchants in the back. I'll set you up on a date with Popeye Johan. The man's a legend. His word was the law on the streets. If he was ten years younger, you wouldn't last more than a few heartbeats. I'll be damned. There goes a piece of the neighborhood's history. Nothing lasts. In this house, we love RPG fighting arenas, and the Age of Decadence features a strong candidate for the title of the best RPG arena of all time. Each battle consists of a mechanical concept, a story, and a funny one-liner from the arena man. There is a ranking system. You get paid for every fight, but you won't actually be making any money, because it will all be spent on the healers and the blacksmith services. The game is rigged, you see. It's still worth doing, of course. It's like Agatai said. Each man you kill teaches you something. Furthermore, becoming a gladiator unlocks side quests. Fighting men are in demand. Protect Basil's establishment from thieves, and then protect Quintus' brothel from armed thugs. Madoran. Many factions of cops, yet no law. And these guys are preachers from Ganitsar. A crowd of intolerant locals is about to tear them apart. <laughs> Much of the content in AOD is politically themed, but that's the extent of it. It's a motif, nothing else. There is a religion, but there is no church doctrine. There are political factions, but all the leaders have the same views. More power for me? And fuck you. Unlike New Vegas or Deus Ex, the Age of Decadence is not about a political debate. It's about attaching yourself to someone with power like a remora fish attaches itself to a shark. Do you think it will ever get better? What a foolish question. Life is never easy. It wasn't easy a hundred years ago. It's not easy today. And I can guarantee you, a hundred years from now, it still won't be easy. Anyway, you have plenty of food on your table and gold in your pockets. Life isn't so bad, is it now? I came to Tehran with nothing. I could have joined the beggars and complained all day long, but I didn't. Don't waste your time thinking about tomorrow. Focus on the task at hand. You were lucky, master. If you didn't find those Daratan relics, or if the old lore master didn't die, you might have ended up with the beggars whether you wanted to or not. Luck, says Fang, had nothing to do with it. I have something special for you. Three Barbary. A lot of gladiators wanted in on this action, but I decided to give them to you. Happy birthday, kid. Hit their hands with aimed strikes to lower their accuracy and reduce incoming damage. The UI doesn't make it obvious, but every weapon class has a library of different attack types, and most of them are useful. Much of the game's tactical depth comes from this. Your next opponent is Nikander. He's a free man like yourself. He paid me to fight you. <laughs> Nikander is a spearman. My favorite playstyle. A trident, light armor, stay mobile and evade blows. The special feature of a two-handed spear is that it can proc extra attacks when someone gets in range, which also pushes the target back and wastes their action points. Unfortunately, two-handed weapons are incompatible with a certain item I will be getting later. I'm running out of people here, Gaius. How about Bendidoros? Big Tracian bastard. But on the plus side, he'll be really hard to miss. Stay away from his broadsword. He calls it the bringer of storms. Some of the best items in this game are craftable. And really, everyone should be getting into crafting because it's one of the skills that are both useful in dialogue and in combat. But if for some reason you don't want to, weirdo, well, the game has a rich selection of unique named weapons and armors. The next battle is against a duo of step warriors. Hit the big guy in the arms to lower his attack rating, and then finish him off with power attacks while tanking the archer, who will run out of arrows pretty quickly. Not the best showing from the Ordu, but they got one thing right, and that is the armor choice. I craft a lamellar Ordu armor with mobility upgrades and crit resistance. There are very few fighters of your caliber, Gaius, and things are about to get interesting. Our next opponent, the Butcher, was once a real butcher. But I guess chopping up cows can eventually get boring, so he started chopping up people. Hence the name. A dodge two-hander build. Hit him once in the arms and then spam fast attacks to proc bleed. I can't believe it! You killed the butcher! I didn't think the bastard would live forever, but... 
Mac the Knife. All Mac killed all kinds. He killed Axemen, he killed Swordsmen, he killed Spearmen. Mac's an artist, and his art is gutting people like pigs. Disregard what he said. The fight is very easy for Spearman. If you are lucky with Prox, he won't even make it to melee range. But if he does, you are dead. <laughs> All right, enough arena for now. Let's explore the rest of the city. Leon here offers a guided tour of the slums for a hundred coins. We agree. It's an Arpager, so I'm assuming this will lead to interesting quest content. Leon takes us to an abandoned alley, and suddenly we are surrounded by armed men. The picturesque view completes the tour. It's going to be your resting place, so I hope you like it. I can't help but admire this man's arrogance. I mean, we just killed the bringer of storms, but now it's a bunch of pickpockets who will be our end. Welcome to the club, the club of 83. The slums is an open-air maze. Despite appearances, it's not a social area. Gaius! yells Miltiades. You have no idea how happy I am to see you! Miltiades is in debt to 40 thieves, who are the Thieves' Guild of the Empire, and he still owes us some money from the Tehran scam. Gaius, I love you like a brother, but if I had any money, don't you think I would have given it to the 40 thieves? You don't mess around with these guys. He leads us to a house in the Trade District claiming the person inside screwed him over. Is this an ambush? You know, Gaius, you definitely have trust issues. One thing leads to another, and now a Madora noble and his two sons lie dead at our feet. So what did you get out of it? A title. You are looking at Lord Miltiades of the Corneli. I'll send for you once I've settled and got the affairs of my house in order. I'll be needing your services again very soon. One of the merchants in the district sells an ancient power cell. A good way of spending some of the gold we just made. Anyways, we're still an imperial guard, and Legatus Pavola has orders for us. When the nobles and the commercial interests of Maadoran learned of Galeus' plan to bring an army of Ordu into the Empire, they plotted a coup. But things didn't work out. The boatmen got involved. And now Strabos, the head of the merchants, is hiding in his palace, shitting and pissing himself. Strabos wants Pavola to protect him. What? I asked for 20 men. I thought they would surround the building and... You have nothing to worry about. So... You are one of those individuals worth at least 20 men? The kind whose sword is a natural extension of their arm, that sort of thing? That's me. <laughs> Strabos is expecting at least two teams of assassins. Hamza, a guild veteran, shows up by himself. The fight is very similar to that versus Mac the Knife. If you get lucky with the first few rolls, you'll be fine. So much for peace and quiet. The Ordu will be coming through the mountain pass to the north. Pavola gives us a squad of troops and orders to head to the pass immediately and hold it against the horde no matter the cost. They'll be here soon, says Boss the Centurion in charge of the fort. You and I have a lot of work to do. You and I? The last best hope of the southern cities. Do you have any loved ones, Gaius? No. Me neither. Boss already sent a letter to Kartor, but it will take a while for them to get here. Our job is to head out to the Ordu encampment and attempt to talk some sense into them. But before we go, it's important to have a chat with this legionnaire here, who sells rare trinkets. Lore masters sometimes bring wonders from beyond the wall. Like this heavy gauntlet. We read about devices like this in ancient texts. It's called Ghost Hand. Maybe the Magi used it to shoot fireballs at each other. Or maybe they used it to wipe the Emperor's ass. By the way, it's rare and valuable. It takes two weeks to reach the Ordu. A bunch of tents and horses. You'll only get to visit this location once, so make sure to do everything there is to do here, which ain't much. I asked for steel, yet Galius sends me more greetings. Is this the way of the Southern Khans? Gaius ain't exactly a master orator, but maybe we can do something to disrupt this alliance. Who are you to question Lord Galius? You'll do wise to remember your place. I am puzzled. The other emissaries carried a very different message. The Khan suspects foul play and orders his bondsmen to take us to the prison tent. 
I mean, I get it that Gaius isn't good at diplomacy, but since it took us so long to reach the camp, maybe he should have thought of a better rhetorical strategy than just calling the Khan a bitch. Two weeks to get there, two weeks to get back. The fort at Heron's Pass is a different place now. Drilled them every day. I told them that Ordu will bugger them first, and only then kill them. How was your trip? I did the best I could. So what's the plan? The defense of the pass against the Horde is one of the most memorable battles in the game. The barricades don't prevent our archers and spearmen from hitting the Ordu from the side. The only problem is this guy, Belgutai, one of their best warriors. So it's fitting that he becomes our kill number 100. And the Khan is the next to fall. Unfortunately, the Horde seems endless. Gotta give them one thing, they are persistent. Calm Gaius, don't tell me you wanted to live forever. Suddenly, the Ordu stop. They stand there for a moment, and then turn around and run. The Imperial Guards have arrived. Good show, says their commander. Lord Gallius' plan has failed. No pet Ordu army for him. After the Empire fell, we were kept outside, like a dog that guards the master's house but is never allowed in. At first, when there were seven strong houses, we didn't have a choice. Now, it's Gallius who doesn't have a choice. The next month brings hundreds of new recruits eager to join the outfit, as well as an offer from Lord Meru of Ganitsar. The guards are to provide security for an archaeological expedition into an ancient ruin. You have a gift, Gaius, says Paulus the Dux, which is Latin for leader or general. Some are born to plow soil, some are born to kill. Paulus doesn't approve of what Carinas did at Tehran, doesn't like emotional decisions. We are in Kertor, the headquarters of the Imperial Guards somewhere in the wasteland west of Madoran. Most protagonists will never get to visit Kartor. It's their loss. These training facilities are not just for show. Paulus sends us to Ganitsar. We are to assume control of the local garrison and help Meru with whatever it is he wanted. But this will wait. We have unfinished business in Madoran, and now that Gaius received guards training, I feel confident about taking on harder challenges. Like the final fight in the slums. Most battles in this district are hard but fair, but this one is twice as difficult than the rest of them for seemingly no reason. I guess the devs wanted to show us that 40 thieves can actually fight. Like Miltiades said, you don't mess around with these guys. But nothing about their equipment or the way they behave communicates that this will be one of the hardest fights in the chapter. Feels like someone put a wrong number in the database. Defeating the gang opens the way into the temple district. It's a bazaar and the Thieves Guild HQ. The reason we are here is to acquire this thing, a cybernetic eye implant sold by one of the traders. Naturally, it's a Vince game, so we proceed to do the most insane thing possible, and that is pay a local medicine man we just met to replace one of our human eyes with this thing. The doctor looks at you and smiles fatherly before asking his assistant to sedate the patient. We take the blow to the head and pass out. The surgeon isn't qualified to work with ancient prosthetics. Fortunately for us, the eye artifact came to life and implanted itself. It is unclear what special function the device is supposed to serve, but we can see just fine, there is no stat penalty, and we got a new perk, far sight. My vision is augmented. At this stage, the player should have a bunch of new locations marked on the world map, so let's go explore. The secret monastery in the mountains. The most picturesque place in the Age of Decadence. No doubt the prettiest location in any game on the Torque 3D engine. A group of raiders made camp outside the monastery. We are honest travelers. We sought a uh, shelter from the storm, but were denied hospitality. What is this world coming to? Such uncivilized behavior should not be tolerated. Are you with us? I'll give you a tenth of everything we take. 
Together with our new friends, we battle the monastery guards while being bombarded by projectiles from the wall. After the melee opponents are dealt with, the raiders climb the fortification and take the fight to the archers, who appear to be civilian militia. This is the entire population of the settlement. If we sided with the locals, this would have been a social location with a bunch of people to talk to. The monastery was built around an ancient but still functioning hydroponics facility. That's how the community managed to survive in isolation. And then there is this big ass vault door. It cannot be opened from this side. There must be another way in. We're done here, for now. Ganitsar, a city on the hill, the third and final big urban location in the Age of Decadence. Do you get to the Cloud District very often? Oh, what am I saying? Of course you don't. The purpose of our visit is to talk to this guy who is responsible for advancing the power armor quest. This is it right there. I found the best strategy for this fight is to move to the western side of the arena, which will force one of the combatants to use a one-handed crossbow. I don't think he managed to land a hit once. The statistics of the pre-war armor are unimpressive, but that's because the power armor is not powered. We insert one of the energy cells we've been collecting and the suit comes back to life. The power armor has a built-in energy shield, which also acts as a control system, allowing you to switch between different modes. There are three. Horus provides a bonus to dexterity, Anubis has a passive health regeneration, never visit the healer again, and Apis makes you physically strong you can tell what mode is currently enabled by what the helmet looks like. It's a projection. There is a conflict in Ganitsar, a battle for the soul of the city between the old nobility and the underclass, empowered by religion. A local noble hires us to protect the jewelry merchant from non-consensual wealth redistribution. They come after dark. The woman collects tribute from the traders for the benefit of the poor from the low town. Lost your guards, Berengarius? Got yourself a killer instead. She sees it coming, but doesn't move away. Her eyes, full of contempt, are locked with yours until the very end. It showed me life for what it was, a daily struggle to survive. No cost is too great if it buys you yet another day. There is more to life than this, is there? And how would you know, Master Gaius? It has to be. We can't show these animals any pity. If they have their way, we'll be hanging from the crosses tomorrow. Did we pick the wrong side? Don't worry about it. Everyone will get what's coming to them. Some sooner than later. You are from Madoran, aren't you? What do you know about Lord Miltiades of House Varus? Is he a man of quality? A man of principles? The quest continues in the next chapter. Until then, we'll explore the wasteland some more. The remote village of Inferior has a, well, a flattering concept art, certainly. It actually looks like this. A bunch of huts circling a stone construction. Well, well, well. So what am I supposed to do with you? Azra the Witch knows much of the wasteland lore. The place Antidas was searching for, the temple of Thoragoth the Artificer. She has been there. I've looked down at the sleeping god that lies there, and wondered if a kiss of a fair maiden, don't look at me, I wasn't born old, would have the power to wake him. What if the god can make things better? Fix all this. What if he makes things worse? When we try to take a look at the gaping hole in the middle of the village, one of the guards gives us a push. We land on a pile of rotten corpses, and we are not alone. A four-armed, ancient, stone demon. The Guardian appears to be heavily damaged. It strikes with four weapons at the same time. A cool trick. But Gaius is a power-armored veteran of the guard. It's the construct who should be afraid. We take the heart of the demon as a trophy. Deeper in the facility, there is a still operational power plant. Curiously, the ancient machine speaks of some kind of defense mode. Activating it fries everything above ground with an energy burst. The village smells of ozone, hot copper, and burned hair. From what I can tell, this used to be a Magi tower, nuked during the war between the Empire and the Kantari. But the machines in the basement survived mostly intact. There is some sort of a portal device. 
we are in Madoran. I can see the arena from here. An ancient corpse. This person wrote something on the wall before he died. Balzar attacked. He is coming for you. Don't hesitate. The price we have already paid is too great. Balzar is known to us. The chief of demons, a living god. The first to be welcomed. The first to bite the hand that fed him. We remove the power source from the portal and take the elevator down. The ancient teleportation device is in one of the minarets in the merchant district. Remember the quests we did for Basil, protecting the inn and the tavern from Madoran gangsters? That story continues in this chapter. The 40 thieves will keep sending assassination squads, and we keep murdering them. So eventually, they come to parley. If it was up to me, I would have you killed no matter the cost. Lucky for you, Lavir thinks you can be an asset to our organization. Levier isn't as clever as he thinks he is. He doesn't understand Gaius at all. Few people do. I met an Ordu philosopher once. He said, you kill a man, you get XP. Here is our character sheet. The next person we take out will be number 150. The arena champion Al-Sahir will have the honor. An excellent swordsman and a master alchemist. His weapons dipped in lethal poison. This is a difficulty spike. You'll probably have to reload a bunch of times. This reminds me, back when the game was still in beta, one of the Iron Tower forums posters, an individual from Kazakhstan, used to run a spare build that was carefully constructed to be good at basically everything at the expense of constitution, a smart charismatic glass cannon. I remember him saying that in the early game he had to reload 25-30 times per battle on average. I think that guy's posting gave me mental illness. Fuck me! You killed Elsa here! The arena quest chain is not over. Now we'll have to defend the title, officially and unofficially. The best fights are still ahead. The Zamedi Tower. Standing in the middle of a long dead ancient city, the building is seemingly unaffected by time. The entrance is blocked by a force field. The heart of the demon we killed in the wasteland village unlocks the way in. The first thing we see is another stone demon reading a book. I do believe we have a visitor. Unfortunately, it appears we're closed at the moment, and I've been instructed to depose of all visitors. The stone guardian was created by the master of the tower, who appears to be long gone. Now, the guardian is trapped here. He can't even go upstairs, can't use the elevator, but Gaius can. Perhaps we should work together. At the top of the tower is my master's study. There, you'll find a triple flex rotter a steel ring with multiple bands. Bring it to me, and our business is concluded. Upstairs is a perfectly preserved Magi library. And here is the ring. We've read about items such as this. It's a remote control. For the demon, probably. He wants his own remote control, so that he could be free. The cleverest thing about the AOD world building is that it's all literal. Ancient Romans with advanced technology. Oh, I get it. They didn't actually resemble ancient Romans. What's happening is that the power havers of this world want you to think that the people always lived like this in order to preserve their legitimacy. This style is called reverse retrofuturistic Rome punk ray gun. But no. The Empire was exactly like ancient Rome, except with nuclear missiles, robots, and force fields. We give the demon the remote control, as promised. Thank you! Are you ready for your reward? It's possible to befriend the Guardian, but we are not skilled enough at the art of speechcraft. The Zamedi demon is significantly more dangerous than the defender of the village we fought previously. He wields sky metal weapons, the highest tier in the game. From now on, we are known as Demon Bane. Legends say the gods revealed much to the oracles at the place called the Arch. 
These days, it seems to be a site of religious tourism. With our mechanical eye, we can see what it truly is, a small part of a colossal structure that only partially exists in our world. The Magi build machines that require different laws of physics in order to function. Thus, the Magi had built them in realms that exist elsewhere. In order to interact with such machines, they constructed devices like this one, the Ghost Hand. The gods are returning, screams one of the cultists that made the arch their home. Send in one of your men. Of course, of course. A cultist touches the surface. Suddenly, he is brutally yanked forward, his scream severed. A few minutes later, his face emerges from the portal. The unblinking eyes fix on you. Ask, it says. I seek an ancient temple. Yes, al Akia, says the face and disappears. We need another volunteer. Another one. But the stories say nothing. Stories are for children. The gods are here now, and they are hungry. Ask, says the face once it emerges again. What is al Akia? It's the place where it began. It's the place where it will end. The path must be opened. A vessel must be provided. The compact must be honored. Ganitsar. Lord Meru. There are no lords here, brother. We are all equal in the god's eyes. He has no guards except for the strange man standing behind him, who appears to be unarmed. They say Phelan can kill a man just by looking at him. It took all my strength when I did it for the first time. I was exhausted and drained of energy for days. Now I can stop your heart from beating as easily as swatting a fly. Well, it's a good thing that he is on our side. Now for the mission. The gods have revealed the location of al Akia to me, the place where the gods stood when they descended from their heavenly abode and took on mortal form to walk with us. We journey to the birthplace of the gods in company of four lore masters. Lost for centuries, al Akia is the Black Mesa of the Decadence universe. Most of the complex is buried. Excavating it would take decades. Fortunately, there does appear to be a way in via what I assume is an ancient ventilation system. The machines are running on emergency power. And this is where it happened. This is where the entities from the plane beyond were bonded with human hosts, creating the High Lords. The God Chamber seems to be perfectly preserved. Seven pods. Three of them sided with the Empire. Four with the Kantari. While we were exploring the facility, the expedition camp was discovered by Aurelian legionnaires. The Lore Masters are dead. Galeus has no respect for academia. And it looks like our problems have only just begun. Ganitsar is under siege by the Aurelian army. We get into the city via a hidden hatch used by the 40 thieves. The noise and the screaming got the attention of a local crime boss and his entourage. And guess what? The man says that despite the circumstances, we can work together for mutual benefit. <sighs> How many times do I have to teach them this lesson? 40 thieves. I killed way more than 40 thieves. So, uh, where were we? Oh yes, Meru. Tell Paulus if he breaks the siege, he can name his price. If the Imperial Guards save Meru, he'll promise he'll name them the Protectors of the Creed, the Templars. Their power will grow as the Creed grows. Meru will oversee the matters of faith, Paulus will oversee the rest. What the fuck happened, Gaius? I sent you on a picnic mission and you start a goddamn war. Don't unpack, you're going back in. Galeus made a counteroffer. We help him take Ganitsar, he unites the land, becomes emperor. The Imperial Guards become the army of the Empire, like in the old times. Paulus considers both options and ultimately chooses to side with Galeus. He is harder to deal with, but easier to understand. I disagree. All that work we did to undermine the power of House Aurelian, was it all for nothing? If Paulus doesn't see it, perhaps Karinas will. We are going back to Tehran. This place sure has changed in our absence. Guard towers, crucifixes, clean streets, new buildings being constructed. Here is our old house. Master Fang fled after the guards took over. 
probably for the best. The changes to the city are dictated by the choices we made in Act 1. In my test playthrough, I joined the boatmen and saved Antidas. The city became a giant mercenary camp. I didn't think Paulus had it in him. It changes a lot of things. You know what they say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Get to the point, Gaius. Carinas is a man of action. If he can use his troops to lift the siege, we wouldn't have to get in bed with Galius. I'll pretend that you came to me not to incite a rebellion, but to ask for advice. And my advice to you is simple. You have your orders, soldier. Quit your scheming and carry them out. <sighs> Damn it! The Aurelians welcome Paulus' legion with wild cheer. Meru and his cadre observe from the city wall. These are the closing days of the era of decadence and the final hours of his life. Just before sunrise, completely unanticipated, ladders spring up along the wall. The explosion blasts a hole in the gate. Here is your chance to prove yourself, Legatus. The final quest in the Imperial Guards chain needs to be special, and it is. Admittedly, there is not much to the actual battle. I don't think I've even took damage. The bodies of Meru and his Magus. Phelan's eyes and fingers are missing. The fucking Magus worked his spells on our own men, turning three of them against us, complains our Aurelian colleague. Good man, too. What happened to his eyes? Taken for trophies. Eyes and fingers make good talismans, or so I am told. We were wrong to doubt Paulus the Dux. Ganitsar will remain under control of the Imperial Guards until Galus delivers on his promises. We are in charge. The Aurelian Legionnaires are to be integrated into our forces. I'm sure they will resist at first. Crucify every tenth and they'll fall in line. I'm going to make you Legatus, not because you deserve it, or because you are ready, but because I trust you and your position demands it. As the result of our actions, House Aurelian becomes Regnum Aureum, the Golden Kingdom, with the largest and the best equipped military force of modern times. From a lore master's apprentice to the governor of the second largest city in the Empire. I am the Shark now. But that's not the end of this story. Far from it. Legatus, says our assistant, here is a list of people who requested an audience with you. Actually, there is something I need to do first. I need to find the lost temple of Thora Goth. The game is making fun of us. The lost temple of Thor a goth. You'll be missed, Legatus. As expected, the siege of Ganitsar and the death of Meru didn't scare away our old friend. Thank you for coming to our aid, says Lord Darganus. It is a duty of every nobleman, says Miltiades, demonstrating his newly acquired upper-class accent. If we let the rabble have Ganitsar without a fight, tomorrow they'll take Madoran. Later, in private, Miltiades reveals that he doesn't think much of the lords of the city and their struggle. We need to improve the narrative. What if, instead of helping Derganus kill some zealots, we avenged his death and prevented a much bigger massacre? Friends, says Miltiades, addressing a crowd, it is with a heavy heart that I must tell you that Darganus, a man I love like a brother, was cowardly killed when he tried to protect you and this great city. But his sacrifice was not in vain. I will honor my dying friend's wish and defend you until it is safe once again. The game has a special Miltiades ending. Unfortunately, it requires Meru to be alive. We have business elsewhere. Real reactivity hours. Our reputation with the Thieves Guild is so critically low, we are being hunted by their SEAL Team 6. They didn't offer us a job this time. They're learning. I, too, am learning. Body count, 189. Remember the monastery in the mountains? How do we get into the sealed chamber? We get there through this well in the Mardoran slums. Remove your clothes, dive into the well, discover an ancient underground facility, activate the portal with a special power cell we got from the minaret. The sealed chamber is a medical lab set up to treat injured gods. It saw frequent use during the war. This is a healing machine. We can use it to improve a physical attribute of our choice. I pick constitution. You'll see why shortly. 
where have you been? Are you ready to fight? The challenger battles begin with a short banter session. Have you made peace with the gods? Asks Hamul. I'm not here to talk. I know. You are here to die, but your soul can still be saved. You see this? It's Galbo's ring. As long as I wear it, I cannot be beaten in battle. What? A dodge build. We are good at dealing with those. Vulnerable to fast attacks. Yeah, he really did have the ring created by Master Fang to scam money out of Antidas. It is belief, dear Ravel. Belief can change the nature of a man. I am Plaudius. Over a hundred men died by my hand. I killed more. <laughs> Almost twice as much, in fact. A heavily armored two-hander user. Hit him in the arms once and then spam fast attacks. You saved best for last? You bet your ass I did. The Widowmaker. They say he killed more than 300 men. Hiding inside the metal suit? You are wise to fear the Widowmaker, but it won't help you. He's right, it won't. I've never managed to survive more than two turns against this guy. Possibly the deadliest combatant in the game. A clever solution must be found, and I know where to look. Hellgate, an Imperial Command Center. The ancient structure is nicely preserved, and this is why. Our combat stats are basically maxed out, so the spider constructs ain't much of a threat. Bentanagbal is a lore master, our colleague from a faraway place. He arrived to Hellgate 37 days ago. How did he survive? Rats. They don't taste as bad as you think. Definitely sustainable. Bentanagbal's mission is to obtain this thing. It's the strangest weapon you've ever seen, says the game. Only a giant would be able to hurl this at his enemies. That's because it's a nuke. A nuclear-tipped ballista arrow. It is beautiful. I have no idea what he wants to do with the nuke, but it's none of our business. We actually came here to get this. An ancient grenade. A unique consumable. We only get one. We only need one. The final preparations. The power armor is a gift of the artificer to man. Our suit is running on two energy cells, but there is a slot for a third. Gaius recalls an old story. A wounded warrior, charged with defending the temple, offered his life force to the gods. They accepted his sacrifice and channeled his life force into the armor, thus allowing him to defeat his enemies. Ra. The ultimate power armor form combines bonuses from all three modes and has a unique look. Fire in the hole! The Widowmaker is our kill number 200. With the arena story and the faction quest line finished, I think it's time we see the endings. Most lore masters agree that the High Lords were supernatural entities, but that is not true. The Imperial Library of Saros was actually built after the fall of the Empire in an attempt to preserve knowledge for future generations. It was overrun by raiders, centuries ago by the looks of it. And of course, there is a secret chamber, a set of ancient surgical tools perfectly preserved. The instructions speak of a complicated procedure that involves inscribing glyphs directly into the bone. On the other side of the parchment is a handwritten message. These words will hold. Now we require a qualified surgeon to operate on us. I had the finest tutors, and my hands are as steady as ever. The sealed medical facility in the mountain monastery becomes the operating room. Master Gaius, can you hear me? How long was I out? Three days. I thought I lost you. Now we go to Alakia and place ourselves in a sarcophagus. A god is created when an entity from the plane beyond bonds with a human host. The invader reshapes its new body, devours the host's consciousness, and wears their flesh like a suit. A fate worse than death awaits the unprepared. But I am not unprepared. I am Gaius the Kingslayer. I am Demon Bane. Bring it, Casper! 
Balzar, the chief of demons, attempts to possess Gaius. Our mouth begins speaking weird syllables. We press our lips together and it stops. Slowly, but painfully, we gain ground, forcing Balzar to submit to our will. All at once, the left side of our face goes numb. Gaius steals the power of a god while keeping most of his mind intact. Many that live in darkness that must be shown the way, for it is the dawning of a new day. The problem with this ending is that Gaius, or anyone else in this game, doesn't seem to possess sophisticated political beliefs. What is a just world according to Gaius the God? We don't know. We never had this conversation. So let's reload and try something else. The Temple of Agathoth the Artificer was part of a much larger facility, several Tevrons in size. Most of it is dust, but the ziggurat remains. The showcase of Artificer's inventions, power armor, spider robots. He had his ups and downs. When Balzar's fury tore the land asunder, it was Agathoth's knowledge and weapons that turned the tide. But after the demons betrayed them, the Magi never fully trusted Agathoth. The order was given to reverse the ritual, banishing him back to the void. There was a civil war. The faction of Magi loyal to Agathoth sealed him inside a sarcophagus, so that one day, centuries later, he could be reawakened and reassume his position as a god of the Empire. No being, mortal or divine, ever does anything without a reason. What reason would they have to help the poor old us? Everyone needs something. Whatever these gods want, worship, gold, temples, is a small price to pay for their help. So eager to give away anything that is not yours, huh? The spells that bind him will fade away one day, and he'll be free. If it's unavoidable, I'd rather him be in our debt. The creature wakes up. He clearly made changes to his host body. How long? Centuries. The Magi. Gone. Who rules in the Magi's stead? Petty men lording over pitiful city-states. Agathoth understands the humans will never accept someone as alien as him as their ruler. So he needs a proxy. He will elevate one of the local lords and rule through them. It's up to Gaius to decide who it would be. We go to Kaer Tor without delay. The Agathoth endings are the most involved and feature a lot of additional scenes. Quite a mess. Can it be killed? We don't know. Can we work with him? I believe so. All that traveling to Kartor and back took around a month. There is a settlement growing around the ziggurat. The ornate mask to conceal the tentacles. Smart. Kneel. And we do kneel. At this point, it's not clear if Gaius even has free will. Many others will serve me, but you and you alone will be the tip of my spear, the scourge of my foes, a warrior king who'd forge the greatest empire this world has ever seen. I like that Agathoth, despite being the last character to be introduced, still goes through a mini-arc of sorts. But what is a good life according to Agathoth? We don't know. The political theory of the Age of Decadence is technocracy. Qualified people should rule, philosophy and ethics are for nerds. Gaius is something of a nerd. Time we get our PhD. The old magic is like fire. It can keep you warm, cook your food, help you forge tools, but it can also burn down your house or a forest the moment you lose control. There is a special music track just for the final battle. Agathoth can protect himself from damage with this cool force field ability. This animation means he is doing a unique psi attack. As far as I can tell, it's impossible to avoid. Agathoth's conventional attacks can be blocked, however, and he is vulnerable to bleeding and also to explosives. The creature is in disbelief that a mere mortal can damage him. I'm a god! How can you kill a god? Well, there is a technique to it, but basically you just poke it until it stops moving. Liquidated. The temple contained neither salvation nor an engine of war. 
the passing of the last of the gods from this world goes unnoticed. At best, you can now spin a fantastic prospector's tale and earn yourself a few free drinks. Honestly, that sounds like a fine life. So here is a picture of Deleuze to aestheticize this video as smart. You know, we can appreciate the age of decadence for being a fun adventure. On a deeper level, we can appreciate the age of decadence as a set of ideas. Some of these ideas failed, like the Tehran chapter. RPG isn't just about systems and choices and consequences, the structure is also important. But many of the game's ideas succeeded. The Age of Decadence invented a new genre of RPG. Someone should come up with a real name for it, but <laughs> Vin's game is an RPG where you are required to use every tool in your arsenal in order to succeed. The character building tricks, the consumables, the item-enabled tactics, metagaming. It's the forum's theory taken to its logical conclusion. Say whatever you want, it's not for everyone, there is a learning curve to it. But these games certainly never treat you like a moron. Furthermore, some of the most innovative things in AOD have nothing to do with its systems. It's the art direction, the characters, music, writing. Every square inch of this game has ten ideas. And you know what I just realized? They never made a second Oblivion game, but they did make a second Age of Decadence. Ha! Huh. Truly, I should be charging you for these lessons. Wait, I do! Give me all your money via the crowdfunding platform Patreon. Game of the Year 2023 is Colony Ship. Patron credits and then we'll see the true ending. These videos are made possible by the contributions of the veterans of Arpeace Legion, including Jim Lawrence, Kyle Shadow Simmons, Dark Bot Pumpkin, Tony Spagani, Ilya Rubin, Ganso Bomber Motherfucker, Source is the best engine ever made, You Got My Ear, I Feed My Parrot Chicken, Yuri Solodovnichenko, My next video will be on I Divine Cybermancy, Miracle Moses Porter, Azazel and Baneful the Doggo, Frog, Nathan Kabiska, a two room apartment in Babruisk, Belarus, alt, gang warfare enthusiast, 1967 Ford Mustang, Eric Luitkehans, Ray Nurse, Snafu, Billy Strayhorn, C6, Danny Kilpatrick, Dmitry Yu, and Buck Swope. There doesn't appear to be any footage of the true ending on YouTube or on the Goon LP website, so in order to get here, I had to replay the entire game, this time as an assassin. A very different adventure. This version of Gaius befriended a demon and got to use the interdimensional internet. More importantly, Meru survived the siege of Ganitsar. So when Agathoth orders us to bring him a lord, we go to Meru. Miltiades is already here, a permanent fixture at the court. Nobody knows what he does. Agathoth, not Balzar, but the voice said one of the exotic endings has the player wake Balzar, agree to serve him, then wake Agathoth and agree to serve him, and then nuke Balzar with a divine spear. But this is not that ending. Are you sure? asks Miltiades after we explain the situation to him. The man sees an opportunity in every calamity. The bigger the calamity, the bigger the opportunity. Unity. Gaius takes Meru to Agathoth with Miltiades tagging along. While traveling, we are ambushed by the boatmen. The truth is, says the assassin, the world will be a better place without Meru. I agree, says Miltiades, slashing his dagger across Meru's throat in a practiced motion. So who am I supposed to take to Agathoth now? Me. Every character in the Age of Decadence is a schemer. Miltiades is the game's way of laughing at itself. Just because he asked for a lord doesn't mean we should bend over backwards and fetch him one right away. You don't want to look too eager, you know what I mean? We had a lord, and you killed him. Look, maybe I misread the signs, but I thought that's what you had in mind when you asked me to tag along. Either way, might as well go and meet this Agathoth first. If he looks at me and says I'm not what he needs, we'll go and fetch him someone better. See? Problem solved. Agathoth is not a god, but he is pretty damn close. Yet, you don't seem to be afraid at all. Afraid of what? I'm not going to fight him. What is there to be afraid of? He needs a head servant to keep all his other servants in check. I am the best choice. I don't have any delusions of grandeur. What they see is a humiliating submission. I see as an opportunity I couldn't even dream of. The way to the ziggurat is blocked by the imperial guards. 
Miltiades fights on our side. This version of Gaius ended the game with more than 250 kills. The critical strike assassin does stupid damage. The Ziggurat. Kneel. From this moment forward, you speak with my voice, and in so doing, you will grow your domain far beyond your petty ambitions. Your enemies are my enemies now, Miltiades reassures him. Just say the word, uh, your holiness. Taking it back, Agathoth looks at Gaius. Miltiades isn't what he expected. But then again, Miltiades isn't what anyone's ever expecting. I shall make you the absolute lord of men. You will serve me faithfully, just as men serve you. I know how it works, don't worry about it. I'm gonna be pretty honest, I'm getting a strong partner vibe here. But I don't want to overstep my bounds. Your first task is to raise a great army. While the fact of Miltiades' divine favor is beyond doubt, why the gods have chosen a man missing so many of the attributes of a religious leader, piety, humility, dignity, is a mystery that scholars will struggle to unravel for a very long time. Wielding the gods' favor like an oversized club, his most radiant holiness, Miltiades I, expands the authority of the creed like a street thug driving the competition from his block in the slums. Possessing an uncanny instinct for weakness, the high priest knows exactly when and and where to strike to get what he, what the gods, desire. <laughs>